Good morning and welcome back to our studies on <coughs> Christian Assembly, episode number 44. <coughs> In the last session, we have been learning about the different uh, phrases used for the local church as well as the meaning of the the term universal church and uh, local church. This morning an important question in this connection which was asked by many in relation to the studies of New Testament church I present here. Many people they used to ask me whether the universal church is visible or invisible. I have already told you that the Church of Jesus Christ has two aspects, local and universal. And universal church is comprised of all believers of all this grace age from the day of Pentecost till the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in the mid to receive his song. This may be people from all walks of life, from all countries, nations, kindreds, tribes, languages and all. But the local church is actually a group of born again, baptized people who are gathering in a particular place to witness and worship God through Jesus Christ according to the same conviction of doctrine and practices that they have oriented from the New Testament teachings of God's Word. Therefore, local churches is functioning and uh, its worship pattern may differ one from the other. But the universal church, the universal church has no such a distinction because all the born again believers of this church age belongs to that universal body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we understand there is a clear-cut distinction between the local aspect and the universal aspect of the Christian church. But here comes a paramount important question. Many people ask whether the church of Jesus Christ is visible or invisible. The church means the universal church is visible or invisible. To answer this question, I would make it very simple. The local church is the part of the universal church, which are locally gathering at a particular time and a particular place, which is visible because the members of the local churches are still here on the face of the earth. But the universal church it lay into three periods of the time, past, present and future. Therefore, in one word I would like to say the universal church is invisible because all its past members are died and they are resting in the Lord in heaven. And uh, many of its members now who are saved are here on the face of the earth alive and if the Lord tarries to come, there are people yet to be added to the universal church who are about to be born and brought up and be born again. Therefore, I say the universal church is lying on the three tenses of the, uh, the time that is past, present and future. And therefore, the universal church is said to be invisible. Many of its members are now in their eternal abode, I said. The universal church existed in the past, <coughs> sorry, present, and will be in the future. This process will continue till the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the last sinner who is about to be born again and added to the body of Jesus Christ is born again, the trumpet will sound and the church will be translated at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Each of the 
members of the universal church who are present here now in the face of the earth has to choose a local church which stand true to the word of god in sound doctrine as well as in its practices today we are going to look into another aspect of the church of jesus christ which is titled as the building of the church or the divine plan of the church church is a building paul says in the book of corinthians we are being built upon the solid foundation which is the lord jesus christ the bible tells us that church of jesus christ is a divine institution which is to be built built according to the very plan which a god has wrought out in his word that means the building process of the church is to be continued only in accordance with the divine plan which god has designed in his holy bible nothing to be ordered or taken out of its building process we have to be very attentive on this aspect that we have no freedom to add anything to the building process neither we are authorized to take out anything from this building process as i told you before in the beginning of my class there is no pictures or no prophecies of christian church in the old testament but there are some illustrations found in the holy scriptures in the old testament pages which would resembles the reality and the the building process of the church of jesus christ number 1 for example i'll say look at the ark of noah in genesis chapter 6 verse 14 to 16 we read that god commanded noah the man of that age to build a on a build an ark for the salvation of his family not only for the salvation of his family god commanded him to cut a gopher tree and uh, make it into uh, pieces and build a uh, build an ark which can contain all the living uh, beings animal beings of the earth that means holy and unholy in each pair as well as all those who will respond to the message which was being preached by noah the man of faith god commanded him so accordingly noah varied he built an ark for the salvation of his family how did he build the ark is the question how did he build the ark bible says in genesis chapter 9 and chapter 6 verse 22 exactly as was directed by god the building process of the ark of noah was carried out by noah and his people whom he he assigned noah noah received the divine design of the ark its length its width its height and the the, the shape of the ark and, and the row of the uh, the ark everything even the doors and windows everything was well arranged and designed by almighty god the almighty god show him how this ark should be built on accordingly exactly as was directed by so noah did exactly as he was directed by god noah had no specific plan or alteration on what was given to him in his heart by god's light that means god revealed him Uh, what materials are to be used how it is to be designed how it be, uh, it, it should be built upon and uh, what should be its model everything was shown to him by his holy spirit and exactly as was directed by god noah built the ark uh, in the book of genesis and look at the construction of tabernacle secondly the first illustration for the building process of the church of jesus christ is uh, the ark of noah and the second is the building of the tabernacle hebrews chapter 8 verse 
Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 and 9. All these verses very clearly explain to us how the tabernacle was erected in the wilderness. The tabernacle, the word tabernacle means a meeting place. It was a place where God and the children of Israel meet together during the time of their wilderness journey. So God gave the children of Israel a meeting place in the wilderness which is known as tabernacle. The very design was given to Moses from God on the Mount Sinai. And we read in uh, Exodus chapter 25 verse 8 and 9. He built it by the plan which God had shown him on the holy mountain. Moses had, had no specific design for the building of the tabernacle. He could not emerge any of his desires or wishes or will in the process of the construction. Everything, every piece of the tabernacle for its construction was well described and designed by the Almighty God on the holy mountain and show him. And Moses, was, Moses has, had received that divine design of the building of the tabernacle. Then he explained this revelation to Bezalel and Ahobiab, two people whom God enriched with his divine wisdom, to understand what Moses explained to them. Actually, the design was shown to Moses. And Moses alone had seen it on the holy mountain. And uh, Bezalel and uh, 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 the other brother, uh, they have not seen the design on the mountain and neither they climbed up the mountain. But what was explained to them by the grace of God that they perceived it exactly as Moses saw it in the holy mountain. And then we, they built or they erected the tabernacle in the wilderness. Exodus chapter 39, verse 26, 29, 31, 42, uh, for chapter 40, verse 16, 19, and 21, 23, 25, 27, 29, and 32. All these words I was supposed to read before you now here because of the laxity of time. I'm just going on. Just uh, giving you these references once again, I'll repeat. Exodus chapter 39, verse 26, 29, 31, 42, chapter 40, verse 16, 19, 21, 23, 25, 27, and 29 and 32. These are the verses. In all these verses, repeatedly it is recorded, Moses did it exactly as it was shown to him on the holy mountain. So the first illustration of the church, the building of the church of Jesus Christ, I told you that it was the ark of Noah. Noah did it exactly as he had received the direction of God. And secondly, the erection of the tabernacle in the wilderness, which was the meeting place between God and the children of Israel. All the construction materials, its length, width, and height, everything was properly and perfectly designed by divine order. And God shown to Moses how this tabernacle had to be erected in, on, in the wilderness. So exactly as he had seen it, he uh, built it in the, in the, in the, in the wilderness. And if God was so strict, my point is here, if God was so strict in the building of the Ark of Noah, and even the, the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness, then we have to understand which were the types of the church of Jesus Christ. How much more he would be concerned on the building of the church, which is his holy temple and which is his mystic body. We have to understand that, therefore, when we study about the Christian assembly, we should pay all the serious seriousness and attention to understand 
how the building process is to be carried out. Those types of the church of Jesus Christ, like the Ark of Noah and the erection of the tabernacle in the wilderness, so seriously and strictly God had commanded the people responsi responsible to build it according exactly that they had seen it from God. If so, the church of Jesus Christ should be built upon the very low or very, very design which God has wrote about in his holy scriptures, especially through his teachings and the teachings of the apostles and prophets in the notice. So let me therefore explain to you the foundation of the Church of Jesus Christ. Every building, as we know, that there is a solid foundation. All uh, structures, that means physical structures, are standing up on a solid foundation. And that foundation, if the foundation is not strong enough, the building cannot stand up. That we know, that's the, the engineering of the, the building. Uh, uh, how, how much it is taller, that much accordingly, its engineering is done on the foundation work. If the foundation is weak, the, the building shall not stand. Therefore, a very neatly and perfectly and in correct proportion, the engineers makes the foundation of a building according to its engineering measurement. In Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, our Lord Jesus Christ said to Peter, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. I have heard the Roman Gallics had a teaching in the old, not now. Now I, I think that Joseph Bulligan and many of their scholars have come forward and uh, made their own uh, good translations out of the original Greek and Hebrews. And before, in the mid-century, the the Roman popes had circulated a teaching to all their uh, dioceses stating that thou art Peter upon this rock I will build my church Jesus stated in Matthew 16 18 falsely independent the foundation asked Peter which is the rock it is very much not in uh, you know term with the the prophetic ideology of Jesus Christ on the building of the church. Jesus said, Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And uh, we hear the word rock is not speaking about the Peter, but Christ himself. He is the eternal rock. The Bible depicts Jesus Christ as the eternal rock of our salvation, which Peter confessed at the, as the son of the living God. Peter himself confessed that Jesus Christ is the eternal rock of salvation, who is the son of the living God. The rock which is spoken here to be the foundation of, of the church, which is Christ himself, for the following reasons I am going to present here. Those who listen to me here carefully, you will understand what I am trying to put in your mind by the teaching of this subject. So, in Matthew 16 verse 18, the rock, the phrase rock which Jesus mentioned here, does it speak of Christ himself or does it refer to Apostle Peter is the explanation here I am going to present. The word used here is Petros. When Jesus said to Peter, Thou art Peter, is a Greek uh, equivalent uh, for Peter, he is Petros, Thou art Petros. But uh, upon this rock, which is Petra, you see the difference between Petros and uh, Petra. Petra is a large rock, large immovable rock, that is Petra. But a Petros is a piece of rock, maybe in any size. There is no uh, disregard for this interpretation because it's very clear from the root language. The word Petros, you can just refer to the Greek lexicon what I am teaching here. And then 
make yourselves assured that there is no uh, deviation from the very root meaning what I am presenting here. The word Petros has its connotation as a piece of rock, a small stone. Sometimes when we uh, take the uh, uh, rice cooked, few stones some, sometimes we used to get in the past. Now we have the sorted rice available in the market. They are stoneless, but in the, in the olden days, uh, many a time back in our houses, when our mothers prepare kani or uh, uh, rice, uh, very often we used to get stones amidst the rice. It is quite disturbing and uh, destroying our tooth. See, those type of stones are meant by petros. This is smaller big pieces of rock. God's, Jesus said, Peter, thou art a small piece of rock. Then, upon this rock, which is the word Petra, Petra means a large uh, rock. The word Petros in Greek speaks of the piece of rock or stone that is Peter himself. Peter, Thomas, or John the Apostle, or whoever it may be. You and I are pieces of rock, only Petros, but upon this Petra, that is the large rock, means Christ who is the rock of ages. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the rock of ages. Uh, therefore the, the, the hymn we have, the English hymn we have, the rock of ages clutch for me. Let me hide in thee. There is a beautiful song. Let me hide myself in thee. And Jesus Christ is the rock which was clutched on our behalf on the cross of Calvary. Jesus said, upon this Petra, the Lord rock, means Christ himself, I will build my church. Now you see the difference between Petros and Petra. Petros is directly implicating a piece of stone or a rock, whereas Petra is speaking about the large immovable rock, which is ever existing. It is quite stagnant. A piece of stone can be move from one place to another place. But a stagnant rock, which is a large rock, we cannot move from one place to another place. It is stagnant there. It is forever existing there. So this, what a great difference between Peter and Christ, well understood by these two phrases. There is a vast difference between Peter and then our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again I tell you, that uh, Petros has to do with uh, Peter and all those who have believed the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. At the age of nine, I believed and offered up my life to the Lord Jesus Christ and I became a living stone by the touching of the Lord Jesus Christ by my faith. And God made me a living stone and I was added to the building of God's temple. That is what the Bible says. I will explain it later on when I uh, uh, take up the the portion, the the five pictures of the building process. So Jesus said, uh, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Which means, Peter, you are a piece of stone or a piece of rock, and uh, but whereas I am the large stagnant rock upon which I will build my church. The prophecy has to do with Christ was prophesying that uh, he will build his own church upon himself. When Peter speaks in his epistles, Peter has written us two epistles. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 6, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 6, uh, four onwards I will read. Okay, please listen to me these verses, so you will uh, easily understand and perceive what I have stated here. Peter says to the, the, the saints who were scattered abroad, abroad in the Middle East, in whose days, he says that coming to him as to a living stone, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. 
You know that it is from Psalm number 118. The stone which the, the, the people who built the house they rejected has become the cornerstone and chief stone for the building. So it is from Psalm number 118, where the psalmist was saying the Lord Jesus Christ in prophecy, saying that he was the chief cornerstone, or he is the chief cornerstone of the building. But the nation of Israel rejected that chief cornerstone. So Peter reminds us here, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Our Lord Jesus Christ was rejected by men, rejected by Jews, repudiated by the Jewish community. Yet he was chosen by God and was precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, verse number 6 says, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. This is a quotation from the book of Isaiah. <coughs> Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So Peter was explaining here, he himself was a lifeless stone. So he says that uh, we uh, coming to him as to a living stone. Coming to him as a living stone. What gave us the life? Peter says that only because we have come to him. Come to him how? Come to him, came to him by faith. When we personally came to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith in his crucifixion and his resurrection, the life from the Lord Jesus Christ was imparted into the heart of the sinner and he became a living stone. This is the best theology Peter presents us here in his epistles. So this is called the Petrine theology. The theology which Peter designs here for our salvation. The soteriological aspects of Petrine theology. It's very important in 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 6 on. Paul Peter says, We who were dead stones, but we came to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, accepted him, gave him our life, and we began living stones by touching the life, the, 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 the stone which, which has life in himself, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So he alone has life in him. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and life. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. So Jesus Christ is the life. Jesus Christ is the way. Jesus Christ is the light. So he alone is the life from whom the life was imparted to every sinner who personally believed in his lordship. And therefore, uh, this quotation is very aptly Peter quoted from Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16. He says, Peter here agrees to the fact that his previous life can be compared to a dead stone. Peter's previous life can be compared to a dead stone. He had no life in himself. And but now, and he received life only because he was privileged to come to the stone which in itself has the eternal life. The stone which in itself has eternal life is nothing but the rock of ages of our salvation, who is our salvation, who was cleft on our behalf on the cross of Calvary 2000 years ago. Therefore, so he exhorted all his readers, so Peter exhorted all his readers, that they too must come to Christ and receive the life from him to become an essential path in the building process of this temple. Here is the meaning of the, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why we people, people are spending our time, talent and energy in preaching the gospel of Jesus? Only the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ gives life to the sinners who are dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, Paul says, We who were uh, risen up or raised up, 
who once were dead in trespasses and sins, and we were de dead in trespasses and sin, but the Spirit of God quickened us and raised us up, so that we should have the life imparted from the Lord Jesus Christ, that we should become a living stone in the building process of the holy temple of God, which is His church. Therefore, Peter has exhorted here humbly to all the readers of his epistles, both the epistles, must come personally to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is who alone is the life, who is the only Savior, to have the life from Him, so that they should become the part of the building process of His holy temple. And so, two reasons I said: the word Petros simply means a piece of rock or a piece of stone, whereas the word Petra it designates the living stone, a large stone, a stagnant stone. It is an immovable stone which, which, which reflects or which uh, depicts the rock of ages, which is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And number three, for no other foundation can one lay than that which was laid, uh, which is Jesus Christ, says Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 on, Paul was depicting the process of the building of the church, which is his holy temple. And this is the third reason which I explain for the foundation of the Christian church. The foundation is Christ himself, not Apostle Peter as Roman Gallic teaches. The Bible says, if the church were, church was supposed to be built upon the foundation of Peter, it would not stand in the time and its rest, but it has been erected upon the solid foundation, the historical foundation of Lord himself, according to Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. So the third reason Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11, and he says that no, no, for, for, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which was laid on by Jesus Christ. You have to understand that the very foundation of the church was laid on by not men, but by Christ himself. No man can lay another foundation. In Matthew 16, 18, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said that he is the foundation, the chief builder, and the owner of the church, and he accomplishes his building by the help of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, he says that, we are being built as a holy temple by the Holy Spirit of God. The, the Lord Jesus Christ is, has permitted the Holy Spirit of God to help in the building process of this, this holy temple. And he uses the living stone for which you and I are the living stones. We who were dead in trespasses and sins, we personally came to the Lord Jesus Christ, accepted him into our heart as our Savior. The moment we accepted him, the life was imparted in our life, we became the living stones, and with these living stones, the Holy Spirit of God is placing in its respective places on the process of building of his temple, and it is being built now upon the solid foundation of Christ himself. Therefore, I would emphasize here in this teaching that Christ alone is the foundation of the church. Number two, he is the chief builder and the owner of the church. Of church. So Christ himself is the foundation, and, uh, or he is the founder and foundation, and he is the chief builder and the owner of the church, and uh, he accomplishes it, accomplishes it by the help of the Holy Spirit. Nobody can claim that this church belongs to me or belongs to somebody else. The days in which we are living, all these sound teachings get, uh, pa passes on to the, uh, the passes behind the scene, and people claim. Some people they claim, or as if they claimed that the church belongs to their family property. The Lord Jesus Christ says that the owner of the church is Christ Himself, because He had laid the foundation for it, and the ownership belongs to Him, and He is the founder and the foundation of the church, and He. Yeah, uses it, uses the Holy Spirit of God to uh, build, build it in a proper manner in this church. Christ in order to become the foundation of the church. The Bible says Christ in order to become the foundation of the church. 
he had to have been examined by both God and men and even by Satan. Because the foundation stone which was laid uh, on by God himself for the building process of the Church of Jesus Christ had to be examined, had to be tested to know whether the stone was fi fixing or fitting enough to be laid on. So he had to have been examined by both God, men and Satan while he was here on the face of the earth. God, in, God having examined his only begotten son for about 30 years of his lifespan on the face of the earth, in Matthew chapter 3 verse 16 he solemnly proclaimed, This is my well beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Christ at his baptism, by the hands of John the Baptist, we re read that there was a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God the Father testified that the stone would be most fixing to be laid on as the foundation of the church. And number two, the very voice was repeated at the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus transfigured himself before uh, Peter, John, and Jacob, James. Moses and Elijah, left and right, appeared to them there on the Mount of Transfiguration. At that time also the same voice came from the holy heaven, saying that this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So God certified, testified that Jesus Christ was examined and was found a stone which was good and capable to be laid on the foundation of his church. And then we know Matthew chapter 3 says, uh, Satan also examined him in the wilderness. Satan, Matthew, uh, in Matthew's gospel chapter 4 and Luke's chapter 4, Satan, the Spirit of God, led our Lord Jesus Christ into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. When Satan tested him and tempted him, and asked him to, say, to, to change the stones into bread the time when he was having the appetite for after fasting and uh, praying in the presence of his father in an isolation for 40 days. The devil came to him, tempted him, saying, Now tell these stones, command these stones to become bread. Then he took him on the top of the pinnacle of the temple and, and uh, asked him to jump down from the pinnacle and his holy angels will carry him under their hands. And after that he also took him on a, on a high mountain and showed all the, world, uh, all the lands of the world and told him, all these things are given to me. Now bow down and worship me, I will get it, get, it, get it you back. Jesus said, Thou shalt worship only thy God, the Lord God. Thou shalt worship, it is written, Thou shalt worship only thy Lord your God. At this uh, testing by Satan, Jesus was passed out. And even the Pilate, when Christ was standing at the praetorium of Pilate, being interrogated before his crucifixion, Pilate the governor of Galilee, he found Jesus Christ was quite innocent and had done nothing to be condemned under crucifixion. Then Pilate wanted to leave him, release him. So he asked the Jews who were standing surrounded, What shall I do with this man? I having examined him, I have found no guile with him, so that I, he should be condemned under crucifixion. Then the Jews with one accord of mind, they cried, Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Again Pilate wanted to release him, because he, very well he knew that he was innocent. He had done nothing guile or nothing wrong that he should be condemned to crucifixion. He asked him, Shall I crucify your king? And then they confessed, We have no other king but Caesar. We have no other kings. But Caesar, let his blood come upon us and even our children. 
they handed him under crucifixion. So Jesus Christ, in order to become the solid foundation of the Christian church, first of all, he had to be tested by God the Father, and God the Father tested him in his, his private life for about 30 years span, and at the time of his uh, baptism at the bank of River Jordan, loudly he proclaimed from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, 16. And Satan tempted him in the wilderness after 40 days of his fasting and prayers. But Jesus Christ overcame all this temptation by Satan. And even Satan could not find any fault with the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, the Galilean governor, Pilate, when Jesus Christ was standing at his praetorium being interrogated, under crucifixion, he said repeatedly, I have found no nothing wrong with him that I should proclaim him, decree or proclaim him to be condemned under crucifixion. Jesus Christ, God, claims it from all this three realm, from God the Father, from Satan, and even the governor of Galilee, Pilate, the governor of Galilee. Jesus warned that the opposition of the powers of hell be always against his church. The opposition of the powers of hell, Hades, shall always be against the church, but they shall not prevail over it. Let me close down my uh, uh, teaching of this class today here. And this morning we have been just examining the biblical foundation of the Church of Jesus Christ, which the Bible says, Christ himself. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 is the prophecy which Jesus gave. Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. The word Peter is quite, the word, Greek word equivalent to Peter is Petros. Petros means a piece of rock or a little stone. Not a large stone, but whereas the word Petra, upon this rock, the Petra, which speaks about a very large stagnant rock, quite immovable, which depicts the rock of ages who is our salvation. That means Christ is the foundation of the church. Peter is the living stone which is being placed upon the building process. Not only Peter, every born again believers are placed on the building process by the help of the Holy Spirit of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11, Paul himself says, For no man can lay and another foundation than that was laid on by Lord Jesus Christ. So, the solid foundation of the Christian church, the Bible described as Christ himself, and the church therefore is being built upon the solid foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. May God bless you by this teaching. God willing, we will come back again for the fifth episode of this Continuous studies on Christian assembly in a convenient time in another day. Till then, bye to all. May God bless you. Thank you.